Just we'll go we'll go straight to the message. How's that sound? Uh, thank you for that prayer for Brandon, and I uh, hope you guys will remember him. Is uh, uh, when when's the next time you got to see the doctor, Robert? Is it the procedure that's going to take a little bit of a while? It's going to be uh, the end of the month. End of the month. Test has to run before they even think about surgery uh, or test for things, but uh, it's. June, July, I should know something. I'll, I'll keep Amen. All right. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the last church here in the second chapter of the seven churches, the church of Thyatira. I promise uh, that I won't make the same mistake that I made the last time that I tried to preach on the seven churches, which is try to cram so much information that it's hard to get through the church. But anyway, we're going to be talking about the church of Thessa, uh, Thyatira, or however you pronounce it. Thyatira, Tyra, Tyra, like Tyra Banks, right? Yeah, Thyra, Tyra, okay. Well, that's the church we'll be talking about tonight, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. Uh, one of the longest letters written to the seven churches, it's the smallest church, but it has the longest admonition that's given to it. And we'll see this here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. It says, And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of all her for, of, of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I cast her into a bed with them that commit adultery with her into a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And with that, let's pray as we get into the sermon for this tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray you would just give me wisdom and clarity of thought and mind as I begin to proclaim your word. May you help me to say only those things that are helpful and will edify your body of Christ. And may we walk, Lord, in, in uh, purity and then just holding fast your word as you've told us to do right here. And uh, may we be people of the book, people of the word who know your truths. And uh, Lord, may we uphold it because we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title for the sermon for tonight is to hold fast until I come because uh, to me I try to keep things simple and this is the, the biggest admonition I see in the whole book here uh, to, this, to this church and specifically the church of Thyatira makes it easy for us so that we don't have to doubt. Of course we know that there are other things that are going on between this woman Jezebel and everything that's else is, that she's convincing them to be involved in but he tells the church, he says, hold fast until I come, which means He's coming, and praise the Lord for that. On a commuter flight to Portland, Maine, uh, from Portland, Maine all the way to Boston in 1987, they said it was a pilot It was on his way there, and uh, I guess that there were some complications along the way, and so the pilot turns over the controls to the co-pilot, and a guy by the name of Henry Dempsey, he, as he turns over the, the, the controls to the co-pilot, he is heading back to check the doors to see what's going on, what's causing the turbulence there. And I guess they hit an air pocket there in the airplane, and he begins to fly to the back, and he realizes something very, very bad went wrong. The door flies open to the plane. The pilot flies out the door of the plane, and the co-pilot is all in the confusion wondering what's going on. 
He sees a red light blinking there upon the control tower or upon the controls and he radios into the airport. He says, we got a problem. I need an emergency landing. And by the way, the pilot just went out the door. I want you to send a helicopter to search for him right away. And so as he gets the, the uh, indication that he can come and for an emergency landing, he takes his plane and he's flying down and he eventually makes it to a landing there. And as they go and they're searching, they find the pilot and he's not falling to the ground somewhere, but where they find him is he's holding tight to the ladder of this small plane. And you can imagine uh, going 200 miles an hour, that's, that's faster than Top Gun, brother. And uh, he's, he's holding on 200 miles an hour. You can imagine maybe on a motorcycle. Have many of you been on a motorcycle? Yeah, and you had the bugs flying left and right. I don't know what it must have been like, but he was holding on for dear life. With a grip as tight as he can, 4,000 miles up in the air as he's descending lower and lower and lower for 12 minutes, he's holding on for dear life that he might not lose his life. And uh, can you imagine what it is to hold on? For this church, Jesus Christ gives them the command. He says, I want you to hold fast. And we understand that if it's something to deal with our life, we will hold on. But Jesus wants us to hold on to the doctrine. I think about, uh, you know, Tom is single when he's parking over here. And his kids oftentimes will go out into the woods, have a little fort set up and a lot of pine cones. And of course, we got these great big pine cones that are stationed all around this great big fort. And, and they set up these little battle situations and they're, they're constantly holding the fort and keeping it so nobody can take over. And that's the way it ought to be. We ought not to let uh, impurity in the church. We ought not to let doctrine or false doctrine or false teachers or anything like that. Uh, I mean, we ought to be keeping the faith and keeping the doctrine and so on and so forth. And this is what I see here that's coming forth out of our text. Jesus gives one command to this church and He says, Hold fast till I come. And uh, it's, it's not particular to this text alone. This word, hold fast, we understand it. It's other parts of Scripture as well. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says this. Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica. He says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And you know the church of Thessalonica, they were dealing with their own Things that were coming in and they were worried if they had missed the rapture of the church. And Paul had to give them some doctrine to get them back on the right track. He said, hold fast to that which is good. Job writes this or says this. He says, my righteousness I hold fast. I will not let it go. Proverbs 4.13 says, take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her for she is thy life. And praise the Lord that we have the book. We can live by, we can walk by, we can uh, hope in, we can trust in. This is our instruction book and we are to keep it as our life. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6 says to hold fast to confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Hebrews 4.14, let us hold fast our profession, echoing Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13, the Bible says hold fast that for the form of sound words. I know it's a lot of holding fast, but you see the point. Hold fast till I come. I like what Paul writes to young Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, he writes these words, verse 10, 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on to eternal life. I know it's not hold fast, it's laying hold, but it's the same premise that's there, lay hold on eternal life. There's a lot going on in this church with what we see, this Jezebel. We can't imagine to ourselves anybody with that kind of reputation being in a church who's commanding the attention and audience of the church, seducing despite the preacher up and preaching the truth. This woman has such great influence in the church that she's persuading and pulling everybody to her own error. And God says, I'm going to judge her for it. Hold fast till I come. Again, it's the longest letter that's written to the seven churches, to the smallest church of Thyatira. It's an important city only in the fact that it is because of its location. It becomes across two great uh, crossroads during the time. And of course, you know all the commerce. You've got to have good roads to travel. 
Uh, you have the, the Byzantium, uh, which was a great big place, a great big city, an important city during the time. That road from that big important city came down to this area. There's another road that uh, went from uh, Pergamum all the way to Syria. Uh, this, 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 it was situated within this area. Anyway, because of its location 20 miles away from Pergamum, Pergamon being the greatest city there was to be protected. This was like a buffer between any invading armies getting to Pergamon. So if they would have an invading army that wants to come out and fight against this uh, Pergamum, they would first have to go through the city of Thyatira. They, they were to hold the forts until they can uh, gather a strong army, prepare and go out to fight the forces. And if they would have take on an, an, an invading army, what they would do is tell somebody back in Pergamum, hey, we got an enemy on the lines, and then they hopefully would come to the rescue. You see what I'm saying? And that's what Jesus said that he's going to do for the church. Hold fast till I come. Uh, it was considered a great w a gateway to the capital city. Uh, again, it was considered to be a military outpost designed to slow down the enemy uh, long enough to fortify the city against any attack. Its fate was to be destroyed and rebuilt many times over. Uh, I, can't, I don't know how many times, but whatever invading army, they didn't care about this city. It was small. Insignificant. Seemed like not many of them cared about what was going on, but it was, did have its place, it did have its importance um, during this time. There was no, uh, no center of emperor worship here like some of the other cities that we looked at. There was no gods or goddesses that people really looked at. It wasn't like Zeus or Jupiter or Cybele or um, some of the other gods that they, the Greek gods during that time, they didn't really have the. They had smaller gods, and really people didn't pay much attention to them. Uh, the ones that they had that they worshipped there. Um, they also had temples and shrines, but none of them were really famous. Uh, it was inevitable that Thyatira would become famous for something. We we know Thyatira because Paul came across this young, uh, this one woman there, and uh, I forget the exact setting. But as he's going down to Philippi, he comes down by the river. There's a woman there. Her name is Lydia. She's a seller of purple. Where is she from? From this town. Lydia, the seller of purple. She was a woman of well-to-do, great wealth, well-respected during the time Paul reaches her, gives her the gospel. She would be able to go out and maybe reach parts of her town with her influence as well during this, this time. But uh, it was a thriving crossroads because of the commerce it was able to, uh, to have. People there had many different trades, just as it would be in any city. They, they had some that were very good with burnished brass. Burnished brass would be something, they didn't have mirrors like you and I have today. And so they would have this special sort of brass that they could shine and make it really uh, clear. So did you look down, you know, like we talk about the military, look down, see your face and the shoes. They would use those brass to do that. Or the, whatever that they're creating during this time. Purple was the, just the, the, the biggest to do with this city. And that's why, I mean, it, it was just a, a... People would go here to buy that special purple fabric. And uh, again, that's why she was so famous coming out of this, this town. She was uh, probably part of a, a dyer guild. Her name was Lydia again. She held a franchise for the purple cloth in the city. Uh, and, and again, Paul came across her at Philippi. Who else is known for this color purple? Can you think of it in the, in the, in the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Particularly in the book of Luke? Do you remember? You know who I'm talking about? Luke chapter 16, does that give you a better indication? Jesus gives a parable about a rich man in Lazarus, right? Rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Where would he get his clothes? The purple, the, the purple would come from this town, Thyatira. Interesting. As the commerce prospered in the city, the city would begin to grow and uh, it would expand, but... 
because it was the, the emperor worship wasn't as they didn't have a temple there for emperor worship. They didn't have the big gods to everybody turn their attention to this small town. Though there was a lot of idolatry, though there was a lot of immorality, though there was a lot of all this going on, uh, it was growing. And uh, the one thing that uh, is particular to note about this place was it had a growing Christian influence. Out of the seven churches, this probably would have had the, the biggest Christian church, believe it or not. The problems weren't with outside the city like at Smyrna, like in Ephesus, like some of the other cities. Some of the other cities, they were worried about persecution. Surely they had uh, the, 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 to deal with persecution. They had to deal with uh, the, the trading guilds and the gods that were associated with it, which I've pointed out with some of the other churches, but more so here that they would deal with those, those guilds and worshiping of gods and everything that was involved within it. And if they weren't involved in the guilds, then hey, they, they might go bankrupt. They might not have uh, a business very long. But they had a strong Christian influence here in this town, which was very special. But the problems were more or less not outside of the city, but inside of the church. Isn't that something? The problem with the church was this prophetess by the name of Jezebel. Well, probably wasn't a real name, but who she's associated with. And one person is referred to her as devil with a skirt on. However, the church has, was to function much like the city did to hold fast the doctrine and the purity because Christ was coming. Thyra, Tyra means a continual sacrifice. That's what the name of the city means. A continual sacrifice. And one of the things that we have to come to understand here with this church, is these guys were continually sacrificing the truth for tolerance. Things like this just it doesn't happen overnight. She gained a strong following, a strong people were coming in, and they, she had this, this ability about her to say, hey, I understand these deep things of God. Christ even calls, he says, no, these are the deep things of Satan. She seems to know a lot of things. She has some sort of special knowledge, the Gnosticism that people were going after that, 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 that sort of drew people aside from following after God. And Jesus Christ was not well pleased with it. He says we must hold fast to doctrine and purity within the church. Is that still true today? Yes. And I'm glad tonight that God's eyes are upon the church. The Bible identifies Jesus in verse 18 as the Son of God. He doesn't identify himself like that and a couple of other churches that we've seen so far. But here, normally it says, He that holdeth the stars, or he that had the sharp two-edged sword, or he that, here he says, the Son of God. Talking about his divinity and humanity all bound together in this one name. And he's described as having eyes that burn like fire, his feet as fine as brass. And the description's also the same description we'll find over in Daniel chapter 10, which we won't take the time for, but Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 through 6, you'll find uh, that very same description used there. But his eyes are searching. His eyes know us through and through. There's nothing that's hid from God. He understands everything about us. In fact, in Psalm 139, one of the Psalms that, that are very, can I say, just really amazing, To know that, that, that God would know everything about us before we were even born. In Psalm 139, we see the Lord has searched every one of us and known us. And David's prayer was, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts, to see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. You see, his eyes were the same ones that we find in, I think it is verse 23, where he says, uh, And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give to every one of you according to your works. The same fire that tries our works, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
He searches us and He knows us through and through. And uh, He plans to come. His eyes, not only uh, eyes associated with His feet and His actions, as He plans to come in judgment to cast this Jezebel into great tribulation. Interesting enough, Thyatira would have grasped this vision of John because of the bronze workers in the day and their work in the furnaces. But the Son of God whose eyes penetrate the hidden secrets of the soul is going to tread the wine press and the fierceness of His wrath of the Almighty. The central theme of this letter is God's judgment upon this Jezebel, this prophetess. But so let's look first of all here at the glowing praise of this church that Christ looks at and He has a lot to say about it. And uh, he points out the good things that he sees here. The commendation, the, the encouragement, things that, that uh, we see here that this church, it wasn't said of Ephesus, it wasn't said of Smyrna, it wasn't said of, uh, uh, of Pergamos. And he begins by saying this, I know your works. What kind of works were these in Thyatira? Well, four different kinds of works. I, I've labeled these all with the letter L. We could just keep with what he says here, but uh, he, he, he points them out. He says, uh, charity, their love, their service or their labor, their faith or their loyalty, their patience or their long-suffering. And we'll break all this down. And first he sees their love. The situation is Ephesus. You know, they worked very hard. They had a lot going for them. They, they, they were diligent in trying those who say they were apostles and were not. And he said, they who hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, yet I have somewhat against thee because I was left thy first love. This wasn't said about this church. No, he said, they, you have love. In fact, you have it a little too much. Your love is going so much that you're tolerating this evil that's going on. Yet you have love. And it's something that's good, something that's be desired. Because it seems like love in some of the other churches was waning. But love in this church was growing and gaining. It was the greatest of all Christian virtues. John himself is called a disciple of love. And over and over Jesus would say of His disciples, By this shall all men know you are My disciples, if you have love one toward another. Constantly and consistently, Jesus points out this love is a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that God desires for every single Christian. Look, when people come to the door, you think they want to come to a church that doesn't have any love in it? You think that they want to come to somebody that they're like, you know, they, they could care less about what your feelings are or what you're going through? No, they want somebody who truly, genuinely has the love of Christ. And he points this church out here as an example. There was no coldness or indifference. No, they truly loved God. They truly loved one another. There was a lot of Christian unity that was going on here. And their love led to a second commendable aspect, a characteristic which we know to be labor. He says, I know your service. Not a work for... Uh, it's not that hard working labor or toil like Brother Ed West does. And he's out there uh, he's shoveling and, you know, out there cutting the lawns and the... Heat of the day, 95, 105, 135 degree temperatures that are outside. Uh, none of this kind of stuff. Though I'm sure that they did work hard. But the love here is more of a ministerial, uh, the word for deacon, diakonos. It's this kind of service, this kind of laboring, the ministering to the needs and necessities of the saints. This is the kind of labor of love that they were showing. It means to serve or to minister and uh, to, to uplift one another, a sacrificial kind of service and helping others, uh, superseding the cold, complacent attitude that just, just does a job out of uh, obligation or duty. And it removes all grudging service and say, Oh, I can't believe I had to do this. Why did the pastor ask me, or why this, or why that? No, he just does it. They did it willingly for the Lord. These people had something for which the Lord could praise them. Their love and their service. Uh, one thing that, uh, of course, I, a lot of the older saints I have 
heard many stories about them and just how they were continually served. And just some of the smallest details, of course, I'm glad for Brother Sheely, Brother Kuhn, and for the work that they do in cutting the grass, but I think specifically of Miss Dottie, who just wants to go and teach a Sunday school class. I think of Frank, and just wanted to cut the grass. I think of Mr. Swain and all the work and the labor of love that he put into this church. I think of other saints who, who have truly ministered in this sort of way, who didn't ask for any recognition, who just said, you know, just give me a job, I'll get it done. If the lights are out, you know, I'll go down to him hardware and put the light in. He didn't ask for any recognition, he just did it. That's this kind of service. Their love, their labor, their uh, loyalty that's characterized here, the word faith, uh, really bringing down their faithfulness. They were very, very, very true to God and to His Word. They were not lax in their attendance. They weren't undependable. Uh, just like Brother Coon says, you know, if I tell you I want to do something, I want to do it. And if, I'm not, if I say I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but I appreciate that. These are the kind of people that would show up to church every single time that the doors were open. They were dependable. They were loyal. They were faithful. You could count on them. They were getting things done. But this is the kind of church that they had at Thyatira. They were loyal people. The last part was long-suffering. They had patience, endurance, patient endurance, and even when their faith was tested, uh, they knew how to bear hardship for the Lord without griping and complaining. It's the same compliment that Christ gave to the Ephesian church. It doesn't seem as though there was much persecution against this church, but they did it without griping and complaining. They bore whatever it was patiently. They took it. And uh, something about this, he says, your last or more than the first. They were growing in these works. They were growing in their love, growing in their work, growing in their ministering, growing in their long-suffering. And it ended up being a glowing praise for these Christians. Accommodation. But then they had this glaring problem and it's really the central theme of what Christ is getting across. He knows this Jezebel. He knows everything about uh, what has taken place. Uh, not everything was rosy at Thyatira. Not everything was rosy in the church. I'm sure when the pastor saw this woman coming through the door, he's like, oh, not again. It was an obvious problem, at least to the Lord. These guys might tend to be sympathetic, but uh, Jesus wasn't. These workers here that were part of these guilds and being faithful to the church, trying to uh, do everything that they could to be faithful to the Lord while living in this pagan society, uh, which was wrapped up all kinds of idolatry and immorality and all this kind of stuff, trying to stay away from that, trying to stay faithful to the Lord. seems after a while that this Jezebel convinced them to say, hey, this is all right. The Gnosticism... Uh, this deep knowledge, they, they believe that you could do whatever you want in the, bi in the body and it doesn't affect your relationship with the Lord. Completely opposite of, of what the Bible teaches. What do we know about Jezebel? What do we know about Jezebel? She tries to control men. She tries to control men. Where, where did she come from? In second, what is it? I think it's Second Kings. For, no, First Kings chapter seventeen. Eight, uh, well, even before then, Ahab goes and takes this woman Jezebel. Where did she come from? Who's her father? Her father is a pagan worshipper, isn't he? Not a pagan priest of Baal worship and all this kind of stuff. And she comes into Israel and she convinces everybody who, who at one time professed to be following God and then all of a sudden, because now this woman is on the throne and this woman is leading and seems to control uh, her husband Ahab, the king. I mean, she's telling the king what to do. He says, she says, I'll write letters to, I'll get you whatever vineyard you want. Even Ahab was bowing down to this woman, it seems. 
She tears down all the, all the temples to God. She, she expels all the prophets of God. Elijah goes on the run for a while. 5,000 is seen. I think it was, what, 5,000 prophets that were locked up in a cave of which the one man hid them away and tried to feed them as much as they could. She had led Israel astray into idolatry. What do you think the, the, the imagery is here for this church? You see, one person can lead, do a whole lot of harm, can they not? To allow this false doctrine to go on, to leave this Gnosticism unchecked, to leave this false doctrine unchecked, to leave this woman with a voice who is out, stepping outside of her boundaries... It was not a pretty sight here for the church. It wasn't one of their proudest moments. But she was very persuasive in her personality. And so Jesus cuts to the heart of the matter. He says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and eat things sacrificed unto idols. Corruption was beginning to take its hold on the church. I'm sure they thought a lot about what Christian liberty meant to them, but they hadn't had it the way that the, the Bible proclaims it. But it was the same central error promoted in some of the other churches, whether it was the Nicolaitans, whether it was with the heir of Balaam. Some of the same stuff was going on here at this church as well. Uh, I think that uh, if you look at what Balaam did, see in verse 14, Balaam who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and commit fornication. Isn't that the same thing that was said of Jezebel? See, this influence was growing all over the place, and uh, they were, uh, it's it just that it didn't escape this, this little church. They had given a position of authority to one who was openly propagating these errors. People always seem to go to one extreme or the other, you know. You can go from the church like Ephesus who was like all doctrine and trying those who said they were apostles and were not. and uh, They were, how shall I say it? They were fighting the battles. Nothing wrong with that. We ought to fight the battles. We ought to hold the fort. We ought to stay strong. We ought to stay true. We ought to uh, remember the Alamo, okay? But does that give us an excuse to not have any love in our services? You see, there's, a, there's an extreme to one end to the other. It's, it's, it's that... Uh, Fighting the battles and the love. Isn't there a balance to where you can have both? It is a danger when those who are all love, the liberal churches who are allowed in anything and everything, just as much as there is a danger with having no love and losing your first love as with Ephesus. The liberal church would say, well, we need to love everybody and their love is only an inch deep. It brings in all kinds of corruption and all kinds of influence so that there's no true sign. Is, is that really a church? But the other end is so much contention that there's hardly any love, we need to find that balance to where we can hold the fort, not compromise on doctrine, but still have love. Does that make sense? Love for the liberal church has become the substitute for doctrine and moral purity, but we need to keep love in its place as well as doctrine. Uh, even First John, he does a, John does a great job in this in the book of First John. 
And he begins to talk about love, and he says, those who love God are the ones who, who, who are standing in the truth, who stand in the truth. But love is a the central theme of the Bible, and the lack of love in any church is a cry and shame. This Jezebel was justifying her false doctrine by teaching Gnosticism. I've already mentioned that. She was a prophetess who talked about the deep truths. And uh, I don't know about you, does your Bible still say this? Does your Bible say that you shouldn't add or take away from the Word of God? When, when the apostles passed off the scene, were there any more apostles? See, an apostle had to be one who witnessed uh, uh, the, the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had to be there to walk with Christ and to... Those who say they're apostles today, they don't fit that criteria. I don't know if you've ever come across those who say, well, you know, I've received some special revelation. <laughs> I know some deep things about God. I want you to sit down with me and have a Bible study. I'll tell you all about it and I will show you the truth. No, if you know the truth, it'll stay within this pages of the Scriptures. And this is where they went astray. They began to try to find out what these other truths were. No, there's no. This is, this teaches us everything that we need to know pertaining to this life. There's, if there's something else, we'll find it out after we die. Okay. Well, this is where they they they've got. This is where the the devil does his dirty tricks because he tries to twist things and change things and say, "Oh, did you know?" Or you know, has God said or you know, surely, if you had to this fruit, you should be as God's, knowing good and evil. I believe that this is the same kind of stuff, probably, that she was trying to push here within the church. Paul, Paul would talk about the deep things of God, didn't he? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, let me turn it over there for, so I don't misquote it, because I know me, I... I memorize these passages of Scripture until I get up here to try to preach it, and then it goes right out of my mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. No, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. It says this, it says, But God hath revealed unto them, hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Yeah, God reveals deep things, but it's not the same deep things that this woman is trying to uh, bring, bring to light or to bring out. The Gnostics taught that the Scriptures were not enough, that there were certain deeper truths revealed to a select, initiated inner circle of Christians. But anyway, we, we know the truth. This is nothing more than the tricks of the devil. Same tricks that he's always played throughout down, down the time. Revelation 2.24. The Bible says, But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan. You see, he's going to deal with this woman and all those who were following after her, all those who fell prey to her tricks and this uh, idolatry and in this immorality. He says, I want to deal with them and I want to cast them, uh, cast her into a bed and, and then when they commit, a, verse 22, them commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Verse 23, kill her children. But in verse 24, he says, I will lay no point, put, point, put upon you no other, no other burden. I tell you, in this life, you have so many burdens, you don't need anything else. The greatest thing about the Lord is He doesn't try to burden us. He tries to help us. He does everything in the world to try to make our life easier if we would only listen. He says, I put no other burden upon you. That's a promise from the, from the Lord. Verses 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. These are the promises that the Lord gives to us. Uh, he says, I want you to deal with these heresies. Don't allow this to continue. I want you to hold the fort. Don't let, allow this stuff to go on in the church. I will deal with this woman. I will deal with her followers. But you hold the fort. You keep true to the word. You stay true to me. You keep the faith. You hold on to that which is good. And this is what He wants them to do. And I'll put no other burden upon you other than to hold my word, keep my faith, and stay true unto me. i put upon you no other burden. The same kind of thing that uh, Paul was dealing with when he went on his missionary journeys. Acts chapter 15, where they came to this 
Jerusalem council. The Judaizers following along with them and all, they say, oh, this Paul, he's teaching us things contrary to Moses. You know, we got to keep the circumcision and we got to keep the law and we got to keep the Sabbaths and they bring the matter before the Jerusalem council. They say our fathers couldn't even bear underneath of this burden. In fact, he tells us, I want to turn it over, over there to Acts chapter 15, verses 28 and 29. Acts chapter 15, verse 28 and 29, he says this, he says, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, that's the first thing, from blood and from things strangled and from fornication and from these. If you keep yourselves, you should do well, fare you well. To abstain from meats offered to idols, he says, if you do these things, he says, I'll lay no greater burden than these Necessary things upon you. Same thing that he tells the church here. Stay away from fornication. Stay away from idolatry. Abstain to, from these two things. They were very vital in our testimony to a lost and dying world. We still have liberty in Christ, and we stay away from these things as well. That. Uh, that we might not live in a world conformed to the world, but live above the bondage to the world. Not tolerating anything and everything, but standing for the truth. But these were the two things that Jezebel was teaching in the church. Uh, what, uh, he says, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. I'm trying to skip down through, through here. The overcomer. Let's look at the overcomer for a moment. To him that overcomes, verse 26, and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give the power over the nations. Seems like a great truth that he gives us here. Those who were overcomers were the ones who did keep, or did hold fast to the end, that did keep the doctrine, that did stay true, that did keep the works unto the end. And when Christ returns, he finds them as such. These are the ones that he exalts to a position of authority to rule over the nations and to put down all opposition that rebels against them. Now here's really what I want to boil all this down to uh, as, as we see this here. I want to just mark to the side note of maybe your Bible, verse 27, is a reference to Psalm, Psalm 2, verse 9. But what I want to look at here is just a couple verses. What is the morning star? Have you ever thought about that? The bright and morning star? The Bible does tell us it does refer to Christ, as you might have guessed. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. I find it interesting that he associates the Word of God and the Son of God here in these texts. Both, both of them together. 2 Peter 1, 19 says, For we have a more sure word of prophecy... Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in the dark place. I mean, they're probably living during dark times. Shineth in the dark place until the day dawn, until the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in no time by the will of man, but by holy men of God as they spake, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, 2 Peter 1.19, he mentions the day star, the, the, the morning star that arises, and again, associated with the Word of God that they were to keep. He says, it's not of any private interpretation. It's associated with keeping His Word. And again, Revelation 22.16, he, he tells us at the end, the very end of the words of, of Revelation 22, what does He tell us? Don't, don't add, don't take away, don't change. The Word of God, but Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, He says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. I am the king who is on this way. But don't, don't you take change. Don't you take away. Don't you add, hold fast till I come. The morning star is a promise of being with Christ before the day breaks. 
promise of the rapture. Some people get this confused and say, well, maybe the day stars are referring to... Uh, Maybe it's referring to the second coming of Christ when He should be revealed to every creature. But you'll see that there's a difference. And again, for sake of time, I just want you to make a note. Malachi chapter 4, verse I think it's verse 1. No, verse, Malachi 4.20. talks about the Son of Righteousness being risen with healing within His wings. And talking about the second coming of Christ, Malachi 4.20, that's different than... Uh, the morning star, the day started, which is, is promised unto the church. See, the church is going to be out of here before the tribulation. And this is a promise. He's going to save them from the wrath to come. But he talks about this woman here, this Jezebel, is going to be thrown into great tribulation, but he says, you don't have that to worry about. You will be spared from that. The day star will come. You will rule and reign with me upon my throne. Matthew chapter 13, verse 43, the Bible says this. begins to talk about the parable of the wheat and the tares and about how uh, well, there was uh, wheat sown and the devil came out and he began to sow tares and behind. And he said, let both grow together. Verse 43 begins to talk about how, the verse 41, the angels will come, gather up the tares, and cast them into the fire. There will be weeping. Verse 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear. Let them hear. You see, the bride of Christ will be sitting with the only beloved bridegroom in the kingdom. And we'll be ruling and reigning with Christ, sharing in that glorious kingdom. He talks about, yes, the dashing, the, 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 the potter pieces. Again, back to Psalm 2, when Christ will come to be revealed to the saints, and He begins to trample out His wrath among the nations, and uh, all the, the, his, out of His mouth will go a sharp two-edged sword. He'll destroy many of those who rise up in opposition, bringing in righteousness to only those who will uh, is that all Israel will be saved in the day a third part will come through and be a part of that kingdom uh, I believe you know some of these scriptures but it's a glorious promise <laughs> I believe that if I was I believe that if I was in a situation where, you know, I just was all alone and didn't have anything and I was told to keep my spot in the ground, uh, I think of David's mighty men, just hold that place until I come. That would have been an encouragement to know that the Lord's going to show up there to help me. To be there right there by my side. To give me that which I don't deserve. A place by his side to share in his kingdom, to share in his light, to, to rejoice and to be able to rule and to reign. But that only comes from those who, who are truly holding forth the word of God. He, he never, God never commends those who, who, who go astray and turns astray and begins to live opposite of Him. He never condemns them. He always judges that sort of mentality. But those who are holding fast, He gives us special promises. You will be with me. You will share my kingdom. You will be there when the lion shall lie down with the lamb. You will be there when there's going to be everlasting peace. You will be there. I know you're an insignificant town and there's probably nothing, hardly any strength. But when I come, I'm coming with strength. I'm coming with power. I'm coming with might. I'm coming with glory. And I will put down all the opposition, even this woman who's giving you a hard time. And it is to be a blessing unto the church. Let us just close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for Your Word. You tell us to boldly proclaim it. You tell us to earnestly contend for the faith. 
Lord, I want our church to always stay true to your word and to your doctrine. I, I don't want... Uh, I want to be a pastor who guards this pulpit. That just doesn't allow any sort of thing to come that's not lining up with your truth. Lord, let us be people of truth. Let us be people of your word. And I pray that you sincerely help us to guard against it and to keep love in this place as well. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's uh, go straight into the Lord's Supper, if you don't mind, and uh, get ready for this time together. The Lord's Supper is for those who've been saved and baptized, those who know the Lord as their personal Savior. And this is a commendable time. It's just a time of encouragement where we're able to have fellowship with the Lord. In fact, when I told you last time in the church of Pergamos where he says, I'll give them the eat of the manna, this is the same sort of thing that we think of when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Well, we're having fellowship with the Lord and we're, we're partaking of it until the Lord comes. It's remembrance of His, his death. And uh, I just wanted to lift up one passage of Scripture for tonight. That's Romans chapter 5. And I'm... Verse 20 says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And the Lord's Supper is one of those institutions that the Lord has given to us to remind us we're not worried about our sin anymore. Our focus is not on the sin. Yes, we are to examine ourselves as we come together for the Lord's Supper that we might partake worthily. Those who are not involved in having a bad testimony, these are for those who with good testimonies in Christ. But uh, the focus is not on the sin but the Savior because the Savior took away all the sin and when we think about this institution, we think about the grace that's been given unto us. And so I call the men forward as they prepare the table, and we prepare our hearts to partake. The elements, the unleavened wafers there, uh, picturing the spotless, sin sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ where He gives us His righteousness in place of all of our sinfulness, that we might live that, that uh, sanctified life, if I could put it to you that way. And then the unfermented grape juice, which pictures the precious blood of Christ that Peter talks about. We were redeemed not with uh, silver or gold or traditions, vain traditions received of our fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And because of... Him taking our place. He took our death and gave us His life that we might live and He's been risen again and we expect His coming. And so, in this, I want you to wait and we'll partake in unity as we pass out these elements here. Here you go, brother. Brother, can you mind praying for the wafers? Father, we thank you for the time.
1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. The Bible says, For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which He was betrayed took bread, and when He had given thanks, He brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Pass out the grape juice now. It says that after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament of my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Let us partake. Amen. Then they went out and they Sing a hymn is what the Bible tells us over in Matthew chapter uh, 26. And uh, so let's close with a, a hymn. If you will, stand to your feet. Sorry, brother, I tried to get you before you sat down. Brother, can you do 261? Tur turn your eyes on Jesus. Yeah.
Then go to a world that is dying His perfect salvation to tell Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full on His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim And the light of His glory and grace Amen God is good. Brother Mike, will you close us in a word of prayer?